Okay, let's talk about magic and its relationship to the chronides or archons or reptoids or whatever you want to call them. Take a look at this cover and its uh, winding path up to the crown. If a blinded initiate enters the gates, the Kabbalah gates, the black and the white, and uh, going up this winded snake-like serpentine path up to the crown surrounded by the sun and the moon. Now, throughout this book, it gives people information on how to initiate into this magic order and practice magic. And there's a, a great emphasis on colors and symbols and the way that things are laid out, the way that you walk, what you say, opening and closing a ceremony, and so on. And it takes years to go up the grade. Now, uh, what, coming to it very quickly, what it's about is learning how to practice magic with entities on the Kabbalah, which would be your Cronides. And they call it angels and God. They refer to the top as, you know, Tetragrammaton. And we'll get into what that is. But um, this is uh, basically very similar to Judaism and has quite a bit of emphasis using Hebrew letters and symbols as well as Egyptian as well. Now, uh, in, on this uh, page uh, 16 in the introduction, it says, it is not something that should be toyed with by dabblers who know next to nothing about the subject, but assume that it would be fun to make something happen. Surgeons who practice medicine without a license office often end up in jail. Superficial occultists who occasionally manage to open psychic doors without knowing what to do next sometimes end up in mental hospitals. So I wouldn't dabble with this stuff. I wouldn't even play with it intellectually. You could um, try and understand it to understand what's going on in the world. Uh, going over here to the next page... It talks about um, um, the, the fundamental practices and techniques of the Golden Dawn system of psychic development are threefold. The first is initiation, astral and physical. The second is assimilation of Kabbalistic and hermetic knowledge, the basic alphabet of the magical language. And the third is personal ritual work. This is all three are prerequisites for advancement into the Golden Dawn tradition. Initiation by itself is pointless without the repeated practice of ritual techniques and individual ceremonial work, okay, end quote. So, you know, they pay quite a bit of attention to their ritual to make this person advance. Continuing on, um, on this page 22 of the introduction, it says, the word um, egregory comes from a Greek word meaning watcher whereas the current can be likened to a large river, the egregory uh, is like a small adjoining stream. The current in the raw power, somewhat of a blind force compared to the egregory, which is more interactive and a personal force. We speak of this group egregory. Uh, we are talking about the distinctive energy of a specific group of magicians who are working together. The single current can sustain several different group egregories. As indicated earlier, there are two forms of initiation, astral and physical. And it goes and talks about all of the grades from neophyte to um, epistemus and associates it with the, the Sephiroth. And you can see from Malkuth to Kether. And um, I've already shown you that Kether is associated with the Greek god Zeus from the book The Black Arts. Now let's continue on in this book by um, Self-Initiation into the Golden Dawn tradition written by uh, Chick uh, Cicero and Sandra Tabitha uh, Cicero. And let's see what else it says. Okay, we'll go on to another page, um, 23 of the Initiation, or, or excuse me, Introduction. It says, the portal grade is another probationary period between the first and second orders during the Initiation the candidate is introduced to the fifth and final element of spirit, thus completing the compo uh, component parts of his or her elemental constitution. The portal is the final initiation ceremony that we will present in this book. 
And it goes on and talks about the outer order grades and um, the gr other grades and what age is a little better for them. They want people to be older before you go up the ladder to have more life's experience. Again, in the introduction on page 25, it says, failure to achieve an, an initiation on whatever level in any given spiritual path or current is usually due to the unwillingness of the individual to sacrifice the petty needs and wants of the lower personality for that which is higher. In other words, you know, somebody just practicing magic for material gain rather than knowledge and spiritual advancement. Continuing on to page 29, it says, it is uh, vitally important that the quest to exalt the health of the spirit, the student does not neglect the health of the body. Physical well-being and endurance are essential to the magician who wishes to perform lengthy rituals as well as astral work. During the probationary period, the student should begin a regular discipline of exercise and maintain physical fitness. So they don't want like some drugged out person. You know, they want you to be physically and mentally fit. Continuing on, um, on page um, 31, it says, uh, this is important. Through the divine name of the Tetragrammaton, which would be Yahweh, Yahweh, proclaim, um, I proclaim myself to be a humble seeker after the light of wisdom and the splendor of the divine. From the day forward, I shall strive ever to prove myself a true and worthy candidate for initiation into the mysteries. To this end, I seek guidance of the goddess Themis that she might reveal herself to me and intercede on my behalf before the guardians of the sacred knowledge. Okay, Tetragrammaton, Yad Hevahe, that's the Jewish name for their god, their cult of Cronus. Um, cult of Z Jupiter Sabaz is the second covenant, Zeus. So right off the bat, um, there's your connection between Judaism and magic. Now, going on to page 27, it says, I am the hegemon of the temple. My station is between the two pillars of Hermes and Solomon, and my face is towards the cubicle altar of the universe. My duty is to watch over the gateway of the hidden knowledge, for I am the reconciler between light and darkness. I watch over preparation of the candidate, insist on his and her reception, and I lead him or her on the path that conducts from darkness to light. The white color of my mantle is the color of purity. My ensign of office is a meter-headed scepter to symbolize religion, which guides and regulates life, and my office symbolizes those higher aspirations of the soul, which should guide its action. So, I mean, take a look at that hegemon, hegemony, you know, there you go. Uh, it's all connected. There's nothing really different about it in Judaism or Christianity. Um, continuing on page three, it says, Osiris speaks, thou hast known me now. So pass thou on to the cubical altar of the universe. So they look at the universe as a cube. Interestingly, they call it up uh, um, Osiris. So as I said, that this is a hermetic. It's um, a combination of uh, Hebrew and Egyptian gods and symbolism and language. Let's go on to page 38. It says, Yahweh alone is our light and bestower of perfect wisdom. No mortal power could do more than bring one to the pathway of that wisdom, which he could, if so pleased him, put into the heart of a child. Now, I've already told you that Yahweh, or, or Cronus, is the Demiurge. And Zeus was supposed to be Sabazius, or his son. So, again, we all connect. It, it all connects. Um, take a look at page 41. It talks about the elements. There are four basic magical elements, fire, water, air, and earth. The final uh, unifying element of spirit will be discussed in another chapter. Okay, this is the kind of stuff that got you burnt on a cross for talking about or practicing during the Inquisition. Okay, let's move on to the next page, um, 54. Here it says the Kabbalah. Okay, it says um, Kabbalah is a Hebrew word which means tradition. It is derived from the root word kibble, which means to receive. 
This refers to the ancient custom of handing down esoteric knowledge by oral transmission. What the uh, word Kabbalah encompasses is an entire body of ancient Hebrew mystical principles that are the cornerstone and focus of the Western esoteric tradition. Virtually all Western spiritual systems can trace their roots to the Kabbalistic tree of life. The exact origins of the Kabbalah are unclear, but it certainly contains some vestiges of Egyptian, Greek, and Chaldean influence. End quote. There you go. So they admit, you know, it's all connected. Um, page 55, Kabbalah is the foundation upon which the art of Western magic rests. Magic has been, has been defined by Aleister Crowley as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. To this, Dion Fortune added changes in consciousness. Okay, continuing on to the next page. Let's see, page 57. It says, read in this context the Kabbalistic origins of the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. Give an entirely new meaning. The first sentence of Genesis, which in Hebrew begins as, Bereshith bara ilahem alhal shamein with athaha aratz, can be interpreted as, in the beginning, the gods, united the united male and female aspects of the divine, created the heaven and the earth, heavens and the earth. This idea of the equality of the divine male and divine female principles although suppressed for centuries by male-dominated societies, is carefully hidden in Kabbalistic doctrine, although at times it has slipped out unforeseen in almost all translations of the Pentateuch, such as in Genesis 126 and 127, and, quote, and God went on to say, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and God proceeded to create man in his image. In God's image, he created a male and female. He created them, end quote. So that's an interesting thing as well. Okay, um, continuing on to another page. Just take a quick look at that hand symbol. That's page 71. I believe that's the Kohenite blessing. We've seen this before. Okay, go to page 83. They use the pentagram versus, you know, Catholics use a cross. Uh, and they use this pentagram to uh, invoke or banish in their ceremonies. So there's, uh, and they... There's that word, uh, God named Modani. They also use the hexagram as well. Now take a look at that um, courtyard of the tabernacle. It's similar to a lot of the Egyptian temples. Okay, on page 155. Let's see. So it's the deity name of Kether, which means I am. Okay, we've seen that in the Bible. That's a, a, a name for God. Take a look at the, the practicus sign. Angela Merkel does quite a bit of that. So do our upper leaders. And on page 371, take a look at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It has the symbols of astrology in it, and they do teach us astrology as well as divination in these societies that would have also got you burnt on a cross uh, in Europe or tortured severely during the wonderful inquisition here is um, the, a, a concentric representation of Kabbalah interesting and we've seen this symbol on the petroglyphs haven't we we see this symbol on petroglyphs all over the place all over the all over the world. Here's some of their charts. Um, 
this is the Kabbalah. And they have a, one of the pillars is feminine, one is masculine, female, male. And the serpentine zigzag up the tree. And here's another. Um, this is the Garden of Eden before the fall. The snakes at the bottom, the serpents at the bottom underneath man and woman. And a, it appears to be a female, a, 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 a matriarchy. Now you look at the diagram for after the fall and these snakes are all over the place and the woman's in the earth and the man is, you know, covered by these serpents and, you, you know, it's not a direct path anymore and the, the, the goddess is crying and the, the king is, is just looking on. And these four symbols are symbols of the elements. So it's a different system. And again, here's that chart from the Black Arts associating all of the, um, all of the Sephiroth with one of the Greek gods. Okay, let's talk about another book by Israel Regard called The Golden Dawn. And let's talk about what he has in there. Um, on page 55, he says, The black cubicle basis represents darkness and matter wherein the spirit, the Rauk Elohim, began to formulate the ineffable name. That name which the ancient rabbis have said rushes through the universe, that name before which the darkness rolls back at the birth of time. Okay, so continuing on to the next page, page 1661, you can see that this is their setup, and it says the altar of burnt offering for the sacrifice of animals symbolizes the clip-off, or evil demons of the plane contiguous to and below the material universe. It points out that our passions should be sacrificed. The Klippoth are the evil demons of matter and the shells of the dead. Now bump up, it says Tetragrammaton means four-letter name and refers to the unpronounceable name of God, symbolized by Jehovah. So you see that it's all really the same, and they just keep that to themselves. Move on to the next page. It says the table of the shoe bread, the single letters, the altar of incense, the three mothers. So they have this, you know, very orchestrated and ritualistic. Page 83, the serpent Neheshtan, which Moses made with it when the children of Israel were bitten by serpents of fire in the wilderness, is the serpent of the pass of the tree. And he set it on a pole that is twined it around the middle pillar of the Sephiroth. And the word used in the passage in Numbers 21 for fiery serpents is the same as the name of the angels of Jeborah, the same spelling, the same pointing, Sephirim, round the middle pillar of the Sephiroth, because that is the reconciler between the fires of Jeborah, or severity, and the waters of Chesed, or mercy. And hence it is said in the New Testament that this is a type of Christ, the reconciler. Okay, so he's doing magic out in the desert. Move on, page 280 and 281. You can see they use the pentagram for their invocation and banishing rituals. They also use the hexagram. That's what the symbol of Israel is, a giant hexagram, um, invoking and banishing. And they have the names Yahi Elohim, Shadai El Shei, Elohim Sabaoth, El. I've already shown you their god is Ju uh, Jupiter Sabazius, Zeus, with elements of Cronus worship and elements of rituals for Dionysus and Set or Prometheus as their Satan. Okay, moving on. Page 308, it says, the use of the Rose Cross ritual. It encloses the aura with protection against outer influences it is like a veil the pentagrams protect but they also light up the astral and make entities aware of you they are more positive for magical working when much distracted use the pentagrams to banish and the rose cross to maintain peace and uh, one of the other pages here on page 415 abba father of all fathers i invoke by the name Al, descend I beseech thee through my being, 
to manifest onto me the wisdom and love of that prodigality of spirit, which are the characteristics of Zedek, end quote. You know, this is, this is what they do behind the closed doors, and they keep all of you in ignorance. Now, that's the, the Kabbalah, which is your equivalent of Zeus and, and, and Cronus and all of the Cronides, which I've already said that they were considered giant and have a story about them. Now, the question is, what really were they? Because we know from the Book of Enoch that they can shapeshift and appear like men when they want to. And I've already gotten into these Nagas and serpent races and how they connect into Buddhism and uh, yoga and, and, and Hinduism as well. Let's take a th look at the other side, the, cl the clip off. And now in Thomas Carlson's book, Kabbalah Clip Off and Goetic Magic, he talks about the other side, the, the demonic side, and working with that. So let's take a look at what some of the things he writes. On page 39, um, the, the tree of life before the fall. To fully fathom the Kabbalistic tree, we must know its prehistory. When we enter into its prehistory, it is not the mundane prehistorical development that we will study, but its spiritual, magical, and mystical prehistory. An important understanding is that the common image of the tree depicts a degraded tree, the tree after the fall. Okay, let's continue reading on page 39 to 40. The fall represents mankind's and nature's fall into matter or materialism if one prefer, prefers such an interpretation. This fall shields us from the spiritual world and an abyss opens between man and the divine. The adept's goal is to once again bring man into contact with the divine. The traditional Kabbal Kabbalistic path is the right-hand path, which aims to restore the original harmonic relation between man and the divine. Prayer ceremonies and righteous living, according to the laws of God, are considered to be paths back to the time before the fall. There is, however, another path, the left-hand path, which fulfills and deepens the fall. The dark adept continues the fall from God to reach in individual divinity. There are several descriptions in the Kabbalah of the fall and the catastrophe that separates man from the divine. It is a process with many phases that are similar to one another. One can find examples of evil aborted primordial worlds, the crackling of the shells of creation, the 11 kings of Edom, the fall of Lucifer and the rebel angels, the rebellion of Lilith, and perhaps above all, the example of Adam and Eve eating the fruits of knowledge." End quote. So Clip Off deals with the other side. Now, let's continue on and see what else is in here. On page 43, they talk about the fall of Lucifer. It says, On the original tree of life, yes, that the astral abode of man is an exact reflection of the highest plane, Kether. Here, man is an exact image of God. Perhaps this is why Lucifer and the angels around him, Samyaza, Azazel, and the sons of heaven, began to desire man. The Book of Enoch in Genesis 6. Yes, it is the plane of sexuality, but on the perfect tree it appears in a sublimated and sleeping form. Lucifer Doth, the original serpent, represents the divine forces of creation that is able to carry out gods, the trinity of Kether, Chokmah, Bina, idea of creation. Lucifer Doth sinks down to man's level and awakens the power of creation and the sexual energy in man. Thus, man can reach knowledge, which is previously only accessible to God and the angels. Doth knowledge is the fruit that man consumes in the myth of paradise. The descent of the fallen angels down to the plane of man and their sexual union with man was a new and forbidden union between the planes. 
Lucifer, who had previously acted as the guardian and the mediator between the divine and the levels below, left his position and united the higher levels with the lower. The astral level of man, Yesen, had been the lowest and final part of creation on the perfect tree of life. End quote. Continuing on, page 45. The adepts of the left-hand path walk another and more difficult path. It is the path that is hard and draconian, but which has the greatest goal, that of becoming a god. Instead of repairing the damage of the fall, the dark adept glorifies the fall and allows the, destru uh, the destruction to be fulfilled. The dark adept crushes the old to let something new arise in its place. The left-hand path leads away from the tree of life and further into the tree of knowledge. The different clip-off can be viewed as fruits on the tree of knowledge. When man has eaten the fruits of the knowledge, God prevents him from eating from the tree of life. The adepts of light are hoping to be resurrected after death in heaven or in a new paradise. The dark adepts are seeking to access the fruits of a new tree of life through the tree of knowledge. This strife is the alchemical search of the elixir vitae or the stone of the wise. The work of the philosopher's stone is the alchemical process of creating an original tree of life that resembles and represents the perfect diamond. By fulfilling the path that began, begun when the fruits of knowledge were consumed, man can now reap the fruits of life. Okay, continuing on, uh, the Sitra Aha Ara. You'll see this term used. The group Therion sings a song about it. But um, the Sitra Aha is, is hell. When they, it says, uh, when the emanations from the left break loose uh, from the, ha the harmonic unity of tree of life, they fall into the abyss and constitute an ante world to the creation of God. If we move on to the next page, it says the Sitra of Ra is hell on page 82. In many respects, the Sitra of Ra corresponds to hell. The Kabbalists identify the Sitra of Ra with Gehenna. Sitra of Ra is a kingdom that arose from God's wrathful and punishing side, Jebera, the fall of man, or some original catastrophe enabled this side to become a separate world of its own. Continuing on, um, when you work with this Klepoth, you're working with demons and they list what they do. Um, if I wouldn't mess with it. You do um, have to make a pack and you generally become the loser, I think, in all of this. Um, the pack part is described in this other book by... Um, Arthur Edward Waite, in his book, the, Bo the Book of Ceremonial Magic. There's your Baphomet. And um, pages 254-55 gives an example of a method of making a pact when you start playing around with clip off. And then here's page 240 and 241, The Rite of Luciferge. Fuge, Lucy Fuge. So that's what these people are into. And I've already proven it over and over and over that, you know, the Jews' God is this cult, Jupiter Sabazius, which consists of the equivalent of Zeus with elements of Cronus worship, elements of the old covenant, covenant elements of Dionysus r rituals, and angels and demons and this clip off is the demonic side or that of satan set prometheus or whatever you want to call it the the question here arises is what were these people entities what are you doing when you contact them is it telepathic are they spiritual are they reptilian creatures under the earth that you're telepathically communicating with 
Um, some of them probably aren't even communicating. They're just doing the ritual. That's the question. There, There is no difference here. There's no difference between what you're working with other than one side of this group versus the other in all religions, mythologies, Buddhism, Hinduism, you name it, yoga, whatever. It's all these Cronides and Prometheans. It's the same group. And some are divided as good and some are as bad. And it depends on what religion you're in because a Satanist will say that what we consider good is bad and what we consider bad is good. They flip it. The question here is, to me, is what are these entities? And these priests and rabbis and clerics and magicians and on and on have worked with these things for thousands of years. And these things claim to be our creators, our masters. And there's two factions. Now, are they really fighting with each other? We don't know. Maybe they set it up to just keep you confused and everybody else confused. You know, play good cop and play bad cop. Could be a situation like that as well. But it's always with a serpentine symbolism. Invisible. The invisible God of the sky. The invisible angels. The invisible this, that. And it's the systems, the systems that work with them and they work with the same group over and over. Now, a lot of the Celtic and Nordic uh, practices are, are gone because of the Inquisition, although it's coming back. Um, you know, mythology they've tried to say is not real. It's the same system. I've already proven that, you know, 50 different ways. So this is, is, is what is going on. And I, you know, I didn't show you all of this, but in these books, what they, you know, they end up doing is trying to teach the, the magician all of the symbols and the names and the, and the rituals. And then they start asking these entities for things such as to make them invisible, to protect them, to um, give them knowledge, to help them transform on the astral plane to something different than what they are, to be able to divine the future, to be um, telepathic, clairvoyant, uh, to gain knowledge through um, at the astral plane. These are the things that they do or for healing. Um, you get into some of the, you know, the, the clip off, they're asking for material things, wealth and fame and revenge or knowledge or, or what have you. Uh, very little of this is being done by the person. The person's not doing the work to get the riches or to get the fame or to get the, you know, whatever it is they're trying to get. They're trying to get these angels, demons, gods, goddesses, whatever, to help them get what they want. And one side tends to believe they're more spiritual and the other tends to be more materialistic. But again, it's the same group, the Cronides, the Archons, the Reptoids, the Nagas, whatever you want to call them. The question is, what are they? And that's where I'm at. And, you know, if you're following my work, that's where you should be at, asking the, those questions. So that's it on my lecture on magic. Thank you.